So I won't waste any time then. Thank you very much to ODI for hosting us. Um, it's great to be here. So this is this study. How do I advance? Okay, there we go. This is uh, the culmination of a, a four and a half year project at the Asia Foundation. Um, it was funded by uh, the World Bank and the UK government. Um, what I'm going to do today quickly is give you an overview of the study um, and then walk you through some of the key findings. Uh, and then I'm going to leave it there and then Lisa will talk a bit more later about some of the implications for donors. And I believe Lillian's going to talk about uh, the implications for, uh, for Burma and Myanmar. Okay. So the key purpose of the study was to understand what we're calling subnational conflict areas in South and Southeast Asia. And this region I'm referring basically from Afghanistan to Papua New Guinea. Um, and try to understand how development actors are working in these regions uh, in order to improve aid effectiveness and reduce conflict in these areas. Um, now the research basically had three major parts. Um, first, um, we, we did a macro analysis of these conflicts across the region, which included looking at violence trends, looking at aid flows, and some degree of development levels. We also looked at um, three case studies in, in depth. We looked at Mindanao uh, in the southern Philippines, southern Thailand, and Aceh. Okay? Now, the methods that we used were a combination of perception surveys. Um, we, we did local in-depth ethnographic casework. Um, we basically had separate teams of qualitative and quantitative methods that were working in the same places at um, roughly the same time. Okay. Now, what we mean by subnational conflict is simply um, armed conflict over control of a subnational territory within a sovereign state. These are primarily ethno-nationalist conflicts, usually in remote border regions. Um, in fact, we found 26 of these over the last 20 years in South and Southeast Asia. All 26 are either on an international boundary or on a maritime border. Um, they're almost always home to ethnic minority populations that have a long history of autonomous self-governance. Um, and usually the insurgent groups who are involved are driven by identity or, or ethno-nationalist uh, political objectives. Okay. If you can see the map, um, these are the conflicts that we identified. We, we selected the conflicts based on our definition and matching it to three data sets, basically the Uppsala Armed Conflict data set, the Heidelberg Conflict Barometer, and the Minorities at Risk. So we didn't just pick these, it was actually based on uh, existing data sets. Okay. Now, some of the key findings from looking at this on, from a macro perspective across the region were quite striking. First, this is by far the most widespread form of armed conflict in Asia today. Um, in fact, it has been for a long time. Um, as I mentioned before, 26 conflicts in this region affecting half of the countries in the region, okay? It's also the most enduring form of conflict. Um, the average, by our estimate, is 45 years. So one conflict on average lasts 45 years. And of course, if we look at Burma, we see conflicts lasting 60 plus years. Um, so these are by far the, mo the longest running conflicts on, on average in Asia. Um, and some of the oldest active conflicts in the world. Um, we also found that they're the most deadly form of conflict in Asia. Um, we compared this form of conflict using data from Uppsala, compared this form of conflict to all of the other major forms of conflict, interstate conflict, internationalized, internal conflict, civil wars, et cetera, and found that this form of conflict in Asia accounts for more uh, battle-related deaths than all other forms combined over the last 10 years that we have data. Okay. Now, if this is such a big problem, then why has it, as, as a type of conflict, received relatively little attention? Um, we hear a lot about fragile states, but we don't hear much about subnational conflicts. There has been some coverage of individual conflicts, of course, uh, but not, nobody's really looked at them as a, as a sort of a unit or as a whole. Well, there's some good reasons for that. Um, in individual conflicts often affect, on average, about 6.5% of the national population, based on our, on our estimates. Um, the amount of territory affected is usually relatively small, usually between 10 to 15 percent. Um, Burma is clearly an exception to that, but for the most part, these are small peripheral areas. The problem is that if you actually add them all up across the whole region, they affect roughly 131 million people. Um, 
1.75 million square kilometers is affected by these forms of conflict in Asia today. That's the size of Indonesia. So this is a huge territory that's actually affected by these forms of conflict. And if you compare this to fragile states, far more people and territories affected by subnational conflict than live in fragile states in Asia. Um, now the challenge for development assistance, and in many ways this is, this is sort of where it all hits the road, where the rubber hits the road for us on this study. The challenge for development actors is that the traditional mandate of development assistance, the traditional outcomes to reduce poverty, to improve education, et cetera, do not seem to have any effect on these conflicts. Now, we start by looking, first of all, at the nature of these states. These are mostly middle-income countries. The majority of these conflicts are happening in moderate capacity states. Um, these, are, these are countries, and I'll show you some data in a minute, where the economy has been transforming over the, last, over the last two generations. Yet these conflicts have continued. Um, so basically, our, our key finding in this area is that most of, the core, most of the core outcomes that development assistance is working toward, economic growth, state capacity, um, democratization, level of uh, development in terms of sectoral development, do not necessarily end these conflicts, and in fact, in many cases, if done poorly or if not done with a recognition of the dynamics of the conflict, can actually make them worse. Okay, here's some data where we look at income per capita growth at the national level over the last 40 years. So there's five countries up there and a regional composite. The blue um, is, is basically uh, income per capita growth. Um, the, the shaded areas are years of active internal or active subnational conflicts. So for those who can't see the chart, basically what it's telling us is that over the last 40 years for this region, the real per capita income growth has quintupled um, or grown five times, yet the number of active internal conflicts has grown over that period of time significantly. And in many cases, these conflicts have become more intense. This data is showing us, um, is a comparison of the conflict areas, these four subnational conflict areas in Southeast Asia. <coughs> um, they're is looking at their share of national income compared to the rest of the country minus the capital city. So this is comparing the conflict areas to other rural areas and secondary cities in the country. What we see consistently is that these areas have had a declining share of national income over 30 years or more. Um, and within these areas, and the data is not here, but it's in our report, if you look at these areas at the division between different ethnic groups, you find even if there's been some degree of economic growth in these conflict areas, that it's mostly concentrated in certain ethnic groups, and usually those ethnic groups that are allied with the state. Um, and so there's a huge amount of disparity in the, uh, in the economic growth that's, that's happened in these places. Okay. I'm going to show you a series of three charts which compare development levels in the conflict area with national averages. Um, for those who can see it, the, the chart basically shows um, a ratio of a comparison of the conflict area and the rest of the country. Um, the red circle is a, uh, is a one for one match. Anything inside the circle is better than the national average outside the circle is worse off, right? So in poverty levels, we see that most of these conflict areas are a bit worse off. Um, but these are generally not the poorest regions of these countries. But if you look at health and education, this is infant mortality. They're actually, in some cases, in many cases, better off than the national average. Same with literacy rates. In fact, we see quite a degree of parity here. The, the story behind this and this is, not, this is not comprehensive for all of the conflict areas. But the story behind this is basically that actually development levels in these areas aren't that bad. In, in some cases with infrastructure, we see significantly better infrastructure in these areas than we see in the rest of the country. Um, and that's largely because these are capable, well-financed governments who see that they're trying to address long simmering conflicts. So they've channeled enormous sums to these areas to try to shore up development and improve service delivery but yet it hasn't had an effect on the conflict. So the study also looked at development aid, ODA generally, to these conflict areas. Um, we used for this, in this case, we used um, DAC data, DAC, uh, uh, the OECD Development Assistance Committee data. Um, 
And there are, there are some challenges uh, to using this data, largely because most of the reporting is at the national level. However, in this case, what we did is we went through a fairly intensive process of filtering the DAC data set to try to find projects that were specifically aimed at these subnational conflict areas. And this is the data that we came up with. A couple of, of, of highlights. One, if you look at places where there is an active peace process and places where there is not an active peace process, there are striking differences. Now, when you have a peace process, and this sort of goes to some of the larger challenges of working in these areas, um, when you have a peace process, the government generally is very open to international support. In places where there is no peace process, generally you find governments who want absolutely no international involvement and severely restrict the kinds of aid going to these areas. Um, the, the areas with no peace process is, if I recall, about 19 of the 26 conflict areas. So this is the vast majority of the conflicts. Um, $4.1 billion has gone to places with no peace process over the last 10 years. The differences are mainly in places with peace processes, unsurprisingly, the largest sector by far is in peace and conflict, followed by humanitarian aid. So there's a lot of programs going to these areas that work on some of the more political issues around peace and conflict. Um, in places with no peace processes, it's less than 2%. Um, most of the aid that goes to places without peace processes is pretty much business as usual development assistance that pays very little attention to the conflict. Um, so this plays out in the sectors where they work, which is mostly infrastructure, um, state building, uh, and, and uh, sectoral service delivery, um, as well as in the donors that are involved. So this basically shows that in places without peace processes, the ADB and the World Bank account for nearly 75% of development assistance to these areas. In places with peace processes, it's quite a broad and diverse array of bilaterals and multilateral donors. So people working in places with no peace processes, most of the aid projects are loans, they're almost entirely through government. They're almost entirely working on issues that are politically innocuous um, and are acceptable by governments who have no interest in development assistance going to those areas unless it's firmly under their control. Okay. So we did a review of the, lar of the largest projects in the conflict areas with no peace processes to try to get a sense of to what extent large development projects are taking account of local political dynamics and local conflict dynamics to, see, to make sure that they're doing no harm. Generally, it was very difficult to see any signs that they're seriously considering the political and conflict dynamics. There are a couple of exceptions, but for the most part, um, large-scale projects, at least in their project documentation, are not looking at these dynamics in a very serious way. Now, that said, um, there's, a, there's, there's two caveats to that point. One is that, in many cases, it's hard to actually tell from project documentation what exactly donors are working on and whether they're trying to understand these places. Largely because, in, ma in many cases, donors do not feel um, that they can even write about these conflict dynamics or the politics of the conflict in their documentation. It's not something they can be transparent about. And as a result, you don't see it popping up in their documentation. So they may actually be paying more attention to it, and we just don't know about it. Um, but second, we're also not saying in this project, uh, from our results, that sectoral development projects or traditional development projects are necessarily a bad thing. Um, in fact, some of the best examples we found were actually large-scale, fairly traditional development projects, either health or, or economic development or poverty alleviation focused, um, that understood the conflict dynamics and were doing some things on the side uh, to try to address the politics or the grievances um, that, that under, underlie the conflict. Let me give you one example. In southern Thailand, um, UNICEF is doing a project uh, working on the education system there. Now, for many years, education in southern Thailand has been extremely politicized and a major sort of driver of the conflict, largely because the Thai government has, for years, used the education system as a way of inculcating a sense of national Thai identity, all of the courses are taught in Central Thai, um, and there is a number of ways that um, basically the education system was used to sort of uh, promote a more centralized Thai nationalism. Um, in the conflict area, it's majority ethnic Malay. They speak uh, a dialect of, of Malay, and 
In fact, actually, the people in that area reacted strongly against the education system, so much so that insurgents have systematically targeted the schools for many, many years. Um, and um, most of the parents have pulled their kids out of public schools and put them in private Islamic schools. Um, so education is clearly on the front lines of the conflict. So what UNICEF has done is working with the Ministry of Education, as an example, um, they have found ways to try to encourage the ministry to recognize some of these challenges um, in the South and to use in, 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 in subtle ways to respond to some of these grievances. So there's been you know, more Malay language education. There's been efforts to sort of recognize the Malay version of history and, and Malay values, et cetera. Um, and that's been very positive. So this is a project which could be, shall we say, 95% education focused, but 5% um, focused on conflict or political related issues. And that actually, in many ways, um, is the most important way of, of influencing the dynamics in these areas. Um, just to give you an idea, I mean, keep in mind that these are strong states, and these are not places where aid donors have much leverage. I mean, in southern Thailand, there's roughly $17 million of annual development assistance, foreign development assistance to these areas, compared to roughly half a billion from the Thai government on special development programs to this area. So it's a drop in the bucket. Um, and so the best way to have an impact on the direction of the conflict is to influence government. That's the, that's the reality of working in a middle-income country. Um, so to work, though, if a sectoral program is going to be working on these difficult issues, it often, though, requires that development actors have some uncomfortable conversations with host governments, or that they find allies or reformers within the government who recognize the problems of the conflict, which are often very political, and find ways to encourage reforms. Okay, so this is basically highlighting some of the constraints that donors face uh, in working on some of these more political issues which drive these conflicts around identity, et cetera. In addition to host government um, sensitivity, we often find donor priorities. Th there's conflicting priorities. Um, in Thailand, you know, uh, the UK government and most other governments have a lot of interests, of course, with the Thai government. Regional security, trade, investment. Why are they going to have difficult conversations with the Thai government about this small conflict in the South? Um, and so what you often find is there's different actors within, within the donor governments who have conflicting interest on this. And there's debates about whether to raise this with a minister or not. Um, similarly, um, in some of our major recommendations for the, for the, aid, um, for the bilaterals is that aid operations and, and processes often are very, very constraining for working on these kinds of problems. They're, very, uh, they're, they're not very flexible. They're, they have very long procurement cycles. They're very risk averse. Of course, we've heard all this before, but this really plays out in a big way in these, in these conflict areas. Um, okay, I have about four more key points and I'm gonna hand it over. Um, first is that one of the key findings, I think, which we're really trying to flag, is that in many ways there's a really a limited understanding of the impact of development assistance on these conflicts. Now, I say that for two reasons. One is that, first, there's very limited evidence base, even in these fairly well-established middle-income countries, um, to understand conflict dynamics, to understand political dynamics, perceptions of the state, et cetera. The key factors that would tell us whether the conflict environment is getting better or worse, there's just not a lot of data. Um, even just on violent incidents, actually, we find very poor data in a lot of cases. I mean, think about Myanmar. Um, you know, just the data on, on violent incidents is extremely weak. So we don't even know if violence is going up or down. Um, similarly, though, um, development programs tend to monitor um, outcomes and outputs that don't tell us anything about the conflict. Um, traditionally, and the Asia Foundation included, we monitor you know, development outcomes. We monitor you know, the number of, uh, of, of kids in school, um, you know, uh, different health indicators, poverty levels, et cetera. We don't monitor perceptions of the government, perceptions of the peace process, um, levels of political support for, for, for different key actors, and, and key, you know, uh, what we would call transformative factors, which will tell us whether the conflict is going to get better or not. So the problem then is that because we don't have a good sense of whether aid is actually positively or negatively affecting these conflicts, we, we don't have an anchor to tell us whether things are working or not. 
Um, but at the same time, we found particularly in the Philippines um, that there's a significant level of unsupported claims of impact by development actors. Um, in the Philippines, for example, 14 major projects to Mindanao in the conflict area, 12 of them were claiming some degree of impact on the conflict, and only two of them were actually measuring anything close to being able to support that claim. Um, so there are some, some major gaps there. Um, I'm probably going to skip over this, but one key area that we found a, a major blind spot is at the local level. Um, the conflicts are often, we focus on the vertical conflict, the state minority conflict, but often down at the village level or at the local level, we find very, very diverse and different types of dynamics, often with local elites or local actors actually in conflict with each other, and that those dynamics are very poorly understood by people in the national capital, by donors, by development actors, et cetera. Um, so our, our study draws out enormous variation between different areas within the conflict area. Um, you know, one area may have one insurgent group where the insertion of an aid program actually leads to an increase in violence, and just, you know, the next uh, district over, you can find a different insurgent group or a different local political dynamic where the insertion of the exact same aid program can lead to a reduction in violence. And these kinds of variations um, at the local level are usually poorly understood. Um, a couple of points on some counterintuitive findings that we found in, uh, in some of these local dynamics. I have a couple of points, ideally. Yep, all right. Um, first, we would assume that in these areas where you have long-running resistance to the state, that you would find that trust in government, in national government, um, was low in the conflict areas. But remarkably, this, is a, this looks at southern Thailand. Um, the data showed us that actually when you compare places with in the conflict area and outside the conflict area, trust levels for the national government were higher in the conflict area, um, with the exception of the se security forces. We found this actually fairly consistently in Mindanao and in southern Thailand. Um, when we looked at um, trust towards elites, <laughs> local elites, you would assume that people, you know, these would be people from the same community, the same tribe, the same ethnic group, but we actually found that people, there's strong indications that people actually fear local elites more than they fear state actors. Because local elites are often a source of protection, but also a source of violence for people who live in these areas. And so there's some very um, complex relations that are going on there um, that we often don't fully understand. Oops. All right, sorry. Should have gotten rid of the animation. Um, this slide basically shows some of the variation. Um, let me draw your attention to the third from the right. You know, th perhaps the biggest counterintuitive finding, this is the only sub-district the, of the 10 that we looked at with a majority Buddhist population in southern Thailand. It had the second lowest trust levels in the national government. So really, really counterintuitive findings from, from some of our surveys. This, I promise, is my last slide. Um, we also looked at perceptions of insurgent groups um, to try to understand how local people perceive the, you know, the, these groups that are supposedly fighting on their behalf. Um, we found very complex and varied relations and perceptions. So in this case, in the southern Philippines, we asked people first, do they live next door to somebody, who, um, to a, a combatant from the Moro Islamic Liberation Front? Um, so then we were able to, s to, to divide um, the population between those who live with the MILF and those who do not. Um, then we asked a series of questions. Does the MILF provide justice? Does it defend the interests of the Moro people? Is it involved in corruption or extortion? We found consistently that people who live next door to the MILF have a lower opinion of them than those people who don't. Um, so if you're a Christian living, uh, you know, the next province over, the arch enemy, you know, the MILF is your arch enemy, you're more likely to think actually that they're looking out for the interests of the Moro people than somebody who lives next door to an MILF commander who's probably in the same family or the same ethnic group. So there's a lot of, um, the, the study really looks at some of these relations and tries to draw out uh, some of the complexities of, of, of these local uh, uh, relations. So I will skip this uh, and maybe just leave it there. <laughs>